All righty. Okay, welcome and hello. I'm so glad to have you with me today. I would love it if just as we're getting started, if you would take just a moment to introduce yourself. Hi Z, good to see you on Instagram. Glad that you're joining us. I'd love it if you would take a moment to introduce yourself. Let me know who you are, where you're from. And we've got more people joining us on Instagram. This is exciting. Today, we are talking about broken bone surgeries and iris changes. We're going to look at case studies and we are going to actually see some before and after photos, pre-surgery, after surgery. We're gonna talk about some of the challenges of photography as well. And I'm just excited to have you with me today. Thank you so much for being there. We've got Joanne from Florida with us as well on the webinar. And Z is from South Africa. Lovely. What time is it over there, Z? And Shaylise is saying hello as well. I love this. This is so cool. Now, you know, the reason we think eye rides change, and they do change, but it goes right back to the 1800s when a young boy named Ignaz von Petschle, I believe he was about 11 years old, he, he tells the story of an owl. Now, we're not sure of all the details, and it sort of boils down to a young boy, 10 or 11, he caught or trapped an owl or a hawk or some kind of bird of prey, most stories say it was an owl and either the the owl had a broken leg or a broken wing to begin with or it got broken in the trapping process or you know we're not exactly sure of the details there and it says that as a young boy he was very astute and he noticed that there was a black line that formed in the owl's eye and that as the owl healed that black line disappeared now, um, that is the story that started his research into iridology as he got older. I mean, at 11 years old, he, he wasn't going to be doing research, right? But he did over time, he became a doctor or a pastor and, and gradually started being intrigued by this idea or continuing to be intrigued. And he can, decided to do research. And back then, research was very different than it is now because he would draw people's eyes by hand with colored charcoals and then he would write out their story and then start correlating well if these people have this marking in this area this must area must represent the lung for instance the challenge is um this story with the owl has never been replicated okay does does that strike anyone as being unusual it's never been replicated you would think that with all the wildlife sanctuaries and the wild bird sanctuaries where um, birds particularly are taken that have been injured and they are um, given the what they need to heal up and then they are gradually reintroduced into their um, into their their natural habitat and uh, you think that with all of that hands-on care with these birds that somebody would have noticed the change in an eye but it hasn't happened yet and so let's see what happens in humans um, but just before we do that, I want to say hello to Valerie from Alabama and to Kylie from Saskatchewan. Hello, Kylie. I'm in Calgary, Kylie. It's good to have a fellow Canadian here. Now, a big shout out to Canadians. We love our American friends and we love our overseas friends too. It's good to have you all with us. Introducing myself, my name is Judith Cobb. I am, I got into holistic healing many years ago because I had health problems that the doctors couldn't put their fingers on. They couldn't rule things out. They weren't ruling things in and I got frustrated. I was also very interested, oddly enough, in nutrition as a teenager. I was raised in a home that was very medical, very standard North American diet. We had adequate ice cream, sugars, sugary things like cookies and chocolate bars in the house, uh, more than adequate actually. I don't think I've ever had that much sugar in my house ever since I left home. And um, and so I, I really wanted to change things. My father had his first heart attack when he was 40 and I was about 15 at the time. I believe I was in the 10th grade and I was very concerned. And so I wanted to take over some of the food preparation. So what I did is I started making bread by hand. 
My parents very bizarrely had a grain grinder and buckets of wheat in the basement that they didn't know what to do with. And so I started grinding that grain and making the bread by hand. We didn't have a mixer. We just I did it all by hand. And I would make pie crusts from whole wheat by hand and cookies from whole wheat and just all that kind of stuff. And so that's where my interest in nutrition started was because I was afraid I was going to lose my dad when I was very young and he wasn't very old either. And then my own health problems kicked in and I, the doctors couldn't help me. And it was finally working with a herbalist that got me on track. That was over four decades ago. Since I've been in practice uh, for the past four decades, I have written several books. They've been self-published, self-authored, self-published, self-authored, that was redundant, and self-published. Pregnancy Naturally, The Herbal Birth Kit Handbook, Healthy Kids Naturally, The Essential Guide to Nature's Sunshine Products, Biokinesiology and Color Therapies Level 1 and 2, and The Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology Textbook. I've also created many courses and I've taught them over those years. The original one was a level one herbology course, and this was like 35 years ago, back before the internet when information was not readily available. This was 20 hours of training designed to teach people how to use commercially available herbs. So, you know, you go to the health food store, what are you going to look for? And, you know, what problems might you have and what herbs might you use for that? People loved that course so much that they asked for a more advanced level. So I created a level two, which was the use of commercially available herbal blends. How do you read a herbal label and, and how do you figure out with all these different herbs in it what it's actually good for? Because it's probably good for more than what the front of the label says. And that went over so well that many of my students from those two courses actually went on to become herbalists in their own right, coaching and advising clients and friends with that information. I also designed and taught the course Biokinesiology and Color Therapy Level 1 and 2. For a few years, I was a certified prenatal educator with the ICEA, and so I designed and taught prenatal courses. And I've also designed and do now teach the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System course, which is a course that is approved by IPA, the International Iridology Practitioners Association, and it contains all of the curriculum required to prepare you for the IPA level one, level two certification exam. So um, with IPA as an iridologist, I need to do updates every couple of years. And even as an instructor with them, I need to do updates every couple of years. So these are my latest badges uh, that I am a certified iridologist with IPA for the and my current badge for that and my current badge for being an IPA certified instructor. I am also the proud, a proud member of the Canadian Association of Holistic Nutrition Professionals, the Canadian Association of Natural Nutrition Practitioners, and a proud member of the Alberta Herbalist Association. All right, now that we've done that, um, you're ready to look at some eyes and Kylie's saying she's got family in Calgary. Yeah, it is a very nice place, Kylie. We like it here. All right, let's look at some eyes. This is my eye. This is my eye conveniently taken March 17th, 2017. So that is four years ago. Now, this is going to be a bit of a sad story. And so I just want you to get the tissue ready just in case. All right. Um, and I'm teasing, of course. But this was my eye from March 17th, 2017. Now, what I really want you to look at here, I want you to look at this area right here. Look at these lines. Look at the gap in between here. Really look at the pigment. Get a really good burn this into your memory kind of a look at what's going on there. You'll see that we've got what we call some reflexives. That's these lines that are a little hyper white, tiny bit of rarefaction or shading in between here. Hold that in your mind's eye. Now, why do I want you to do that? Because this is me, March 13th, 2019, just about exactly two years later trying to get downtown for an early, for a, a class that day. It was early in the morning, 7 a.m., which is still dark here at that time of year. Did not notice the black ice on the sidewalk. Walking with purpose and determination, went down hard, slipped on that ice, went down hard, landed on my, my hand. 
broke my wrist. This is while I'm in the ER waiting to be assessed. Um, this is not how my eye or my, my wrist looked the day prior to this. This was not a happy thing to have happened. So this is not good. Here is one of the x-rays. This is not how your bone should look. It should not have jagged edges pointing out. Okay, so that's one of the breaks. There were actually two breaks in my wrist, one here and one in another bone, which I'll try to show you in the next image. Now, um, they, the doctors tried to do what was called a closed reduction where they just pull and tug and massage. I am ever so grateful for medication for really, really heavy drugs that totally, of course, knock you out and make you forget everything. My husband watched it. He said he had, there were nurses literally pressing on my chest to hold my body in place while doctors and nurses were pulling on, holding my arm and pulling on my hand and trying to massage things into place. I'm sure I would have passed out from the pain. At any rate, um, they really tried to get it to line up and they were not able to. This is the break from another angle. And there was another, there's another broken bone up in here somewhere, but I don't know how to read the x-ray. So it's up in there. So it ended up being a double surgery, two incisions to insert two metal plates. This is what my poor hand looked like on March 14th after um, the open reduction, which is what they call the surgery to do this, and a double internal stabilization. My fingers were so fat. I could not move them. They were so sore. And, and I just, and I was so coming out of that anesthetic. It was the general anesthetic for the surgery was the worst thing I've ever been through. It was awful. I couldn't move my fingers on their own. They were so swollen. I literally had to use my other hand to stretch things out and curve them down. And but look at my eye. I had the presence of mind on the 19th of March. So this is two days after surgery, still a little bit of drugs in my brain. Look at this. Okay, pupil is a little larger. That is to be expected because my adrenal glands were stressed, right? The meds, the trauma, the shock, everything. Adrenals were stressed. Pupil was a little larger. So you'll notice this is a little bit wavier, but notice that other than the waviness from the pupil being larger, there is no black line in here. Now, wouldn't you think that with the trauma of two broken bones, a double surgery and two metal plates in my wrist, that something would have shown up in the iris? So, um, uh, so there we have it. That is what my eye looked like or what my x-rays looked like uh, two weeks post-surgery on cast change day. So going in to get the surgical cast changed, I asked the very kind surgeon as he was looking at my x-rays of how was I healing? Could they actually take the surgical cast off? I gave him my camera and I said, could you take pictures of those for me? When he very kindly did, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, and then I nearly passed out because looking at the x-ray in real life was enough to just make my stomach and my brain go whoosh. Here we go from the other angle. So two plates, 12 screws. There we go. I'm semi-bionic. I do not set off metal detectors in the airport, just saying. Um, but there we go. That is my arm. This was one of the incisions, and you, I don't know if you can actually, you can see a little bit of it right in here for those of you who are on Instagram and those of you who are um, with me on, on the, now just a minute, I don't even have my camera turned on, I don't think, just a second, I want to show this to everybody, so I just need to move that over, come down here, oh yeah, just hang on, hang on. There we go, let's start the video. Hello. So I don't know if you can see it in here. There is an incision right between these tendons. There's a scar there. So that's that one. And the one on the side of the arm, for those of you who are with me here, you can see a little bit of a line down here. And those of you, I don't know if I can turn my arm that direction. I'm just gonna move this. There we go. There is a line right down here. And actually, if you can feel it, you can feel the outline of the plate in, in my wrist on the side. You can't feel 
the one that's under the tendons, thank goodness, because that would just probably drive me nuts. I still am not used to the feeling of that plate on the side of my arm. Sometimes it gets banged against the sink or something and it's like, ah, right, it's not fun. So there we have it, March 29th. And then, there you go. Sorry, Kylie. Yeah, um, I forgot to turn the video on. My apologies. Hopefully, did every did everybody see the scars though? Wants to see them. <laughs> if you want to see the actual scars on my arm, just let me know. Just put scars in the messages, and I'll see that, and I'll show you my scars, my battle wounds. I feel like a guy bragging about battle wounds here. So now here's here's the problem. Okay, this is. Um, what my eyes looks like on April 3rd. Okay, so we still, it looks the same. There's no change here. None, none, no change. This is where the arm should be. It, depending on which iris map you use, this is the approximate region. There has been no change. So let's look at those three images side by side. Now, when we see color changes from one eye to the next, I want you to remember that has to do with technology. It doesn't have to do with I cleansed or something purified or whatever. Um, this, uh, you know, when you're in a bit of a drugged state, you might not be using the exact camera settings you used when you were functioning properly. And so we look down here at the arm area and we compare it to the arm area and we compare that to the arm area. Now it looks like things have shifted because my camera is handheld and trying to take photos with my iridology camera with one hand. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. All right, so you see that? Not a change, oldest to newest. Okay, so let's just add a layer to the story, okay? That worked for you. Just need to make sure we're staying on time here. So on Mother's Day, so we're talking like just a few weeks later, we were at my son's house. I slipped on the stairs, note to self, never wear high heels when going up or down stairs. I slipped, fell down the stairs, landed on a landing that was ceramic tile, landed on my elbow and snapped the electronon, the end off my elbow. Okay, so we've got two breaks in less than two calendar months. Well, three breaks, twice the first time, one the second time. All right, so this is me waiting in the hospital. My elbow does not usually look like that. And I'm now teasing the hospital staff saying I should get frequent flyer points. Actually, the anesthetist that knocked me out for this surgery was the one who was there for my wrist surgery as well. And he and I had a little laugh about, hmm, we have to stop meeting like this but you'd think they'd give you frequent flyer points when you show up with broken bones twice in two months, right? Uh, they don't, they don't. So this is post-surgery wearing a surgical cast and a sling. Um, I learned that scrub tops are fabulous for this. I fell in love with scrubs. The necks are big enough, or the, sorry, the sleeves are big enough to actually get a cast through and they've got pockets on them, pockets all over the place for carrying things that you can't manage to hold in your hand because your hand looks like it's sausage fingers again. So what did my eye look like? It looks exactly the same. So um, this time I wasn't quite as on the ball. Again, another major surgery. And it took me about two weeks after the surgery to think, oh yeah, I should be taking pictures of this. But again, there's not a change anywhere that's saying scar tissue in the arm, in the arm bone, surgery, nothing like that, not even a hint. So why is that? Why did these breaks not change my eyes the way Ignaz von Petschley said they changed the owl's eyes? Here's what it comes down to. What we see in the structure of the eye the way the fibers are sitting in the eye is inherent. It's what we inherited from our parents. I didn't inherit a broken wrist or a broken elbow from my parents. Thank goodness, wouldn't that be something? And so because of that, and then because the brakes didn't change my genetic structure, the plates and screws didn't change my genetic structure, it's not, those things are not going to change what we see in the eye. 
Okay, so they wanted, they re x rayed my wrist to make sure I hadn't blown anything there. This is what my elbow now looks like. It has um, this hook that is on a screw attached to wires that go through this bone. And they, they twist that up nice and tight to hold the electron onto the other part of the elbow. And again, um, I don't know, these, this scar seems to be hiding quite well. I'll turn on this light. Those of you who are on the camera, you probably can't see it. It comes right down here. And those of you who are with me on Instagram, again, it might not be very visible. It comes right down here across the tip of the bone and around under the arm. At any rate, so that is the arm again, again. And September 2nd, I kept thinking, maybe I'll see a change if I keep taking pictures long enough. But again, I'm gonna turn that light off because it's in my face. Um, nothing, there's nothing showing up here. There's no extra black line. There's no radial furrow. There's no, no nothing, nothing has changed. And so my conclusion from this is that breaks and surgeries and traumas do not reflexly show up in the iris because breaks and surgeries and traumas don't actually change our genetic structure. Now, my arm is totally healed up. It's as close to as good as new as it can be. I've got about 97, 98% uh, range of motion, which I'm going to tell you, I am thankful to the medical doctors, even though I'm holistic, I'm ever so grateful to the medical doctors because Without them, where would I be? I'd have a gimped arm and be in constant pain. I am grateful to my physiotherapist. I call him my all-star. We've had a relationship now for 15 years because uh, I do little sports injuries and he helps me fix. But when I went in, he said, people are lucky to get 70% of their range of motion back. The things he did to me hurt me badly. Oh, I cried in those sessions. I cried at home doing my homework, doing my exercises. But now that arm again, almost, uh, you know, it's got like 97, 98% range of motion in wrist and elbow. So I am grateful for that. And on top of all of that, I did everything I know to do holistically with herbs, nutrition, essential oils, ionic foot baths, you name it. If I thought it would help, it would do it. Now let's look at some other eyes. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the before image for this. This is a young girl who at the time of of taking these photos was 17 or was she 18? She might've been 18. She was just finishing. She was halfway through her grade 12 year when somebody in school decided it would be very funny to whack her over the head with a very thick book. He whacked her on the front corner of her head and it gave her a very serious concussion that nearly cost her the academic year. And this Marking is what we call a trauma fork. This comes up when there has been a significant, usually physical trauma. This is saying trauma to the head. Huh. And so this came up. Her mom says she didn't notice this before, uh, but she did notice it after she brought her daughter in. This is a client, this daughter I've actually worked with since before she was born. The mom came to me to, uh, the mom and dad came to me with help, wanting help getting pregnant. And so... This wasn't in her eye that anybody had noticed prior, but afterwards this was there. This is a trauma fork. Will this go away? It will fade. It will likely never go away. Okay, so the sclera is not genetic. The sclera is primarily what's happening right now and the impact of what's happening right now. Christina, good to have you with us. You can catch the rest of this on the recording. Here's another trauma fork. Okay, so this is another one of my clients. Uh, she had this trauma fork when she came to see me for the first time. And um, I asked her, have you ever had a head impact? And she had. Let's look at a, an abdominal surgery. This was in one of my sons, right? And he, he developed a, an abdominal uh, hernia that needed to be repaired. It was at risk of strangulating his bowel. And so we needed to get him into surgery. We actually had him leave town for surgery because the wait here in Calgary would have been 18 months to two years. 
because we were able to find a surgeon in another small town, he was able to get into surgery within six weeks, which was really great. When we look at the abdomen and look down here, when uh, uh, different, different parts of the abdomen, let's just look at the whole bottom part of the eye. And when we compare it to before the surgery to after the surgery, we see nothing. There is no change. There is no indication that he's had surgery. Again, notice the pupil size, but also notice here the different lighting. This camera used very bright LED lights. This uses tempered LED lights. So the bright lights will make the pupil smaller. The, slight, the tempered lights will allow the pupil to be larger which will make the fibers appear wavier. And so when we see that waviness, that's not, oh my goodness, something's happening. Always look at the pupil size, always look at the tech, always look at the intensity of the light because that will change how a photo appears. You need to understand the tech that was used in order to analyze the iris properly. But there's no indication here, no black gapping that suggests that there was a surgery. This is another fellow, been a client of mine for many years. In 2017, uh, three years prior um, to a diagnosis of stage two colon cancer. So in 2017, we look down here, his colon cancer was in the, um, the bottom of the descending colon. So that would show up right around uh, in this this area right down in here. So we've got a bit of, of shadowing, a bit of, of flecky kind of pigment happening right here. A year later, we re-shot his pictures just because he had some concerns. And I so I shot these pictures because the symptoms he had was blood on his stools. His doctor was saying it was just hemorrhoids. Don't worry about it. Take a stool softener. And I kept saying, you need another opinion. You need to get this checked out. Um, you need a different doctor. And so we're seeing the exact same markings, but there is nothing here. Whoops, we flipped. There is nothing here that is actually saying hard and fast cancer. And then six weeks post-surgery, same day, same camera, but slightly different lighting. And you know it's different lighting because we've got the different light artifacts. Notice how the different lighting changes the colors we see. That's really, really important. This is actually more accurate physiologically. But I want you to look again and see that right here, we have that same little bit of speckly stuff. Uh, we've got the collarette pinching in here. We've got the collarette pinching in here. We've got a little bit of shading here. Exact same day, six weeks post-surgery. So he had his bowel resectioned. They took out 12 inches of his bowel. He did not need an ostomy for which he was grateful. But we see all of the exact same markings. Nothing has changed in this bowel area at all that says he had a surgery. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the eyes do not register surgeries, bone breaks, the, uh, the iroids themselves do not register things that are not genetic. There has to be a genetic undercurrent for it to show up in the iris, not so the sclera, but absolutely so the iris. All right, so with that, um, any questions? Any questions or comments? I've been watching for questions and comments and haven't seen anything specific to what we're talking about. Hi, Carmen. Hi, Peggy. Good to see you on Facebook with us. Excellent. With that, then, with your permission, I'd like to spend just a moment and introduce you to an iridology course. This course, uh, there's not going to be any high pressure sales tactics. You know, don't even get your wallet out because we're not even talking about stuff like that. This is just basic core information. The Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is the only live online mentored, fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care. You know, so often what I see is that holistic practitioners see the client, 
they gather information, then they go off and they create a protocol for the client and bring that protocol back to the next appointment. Problem is the practitioners don't get paid for the time that they are off doing that program development. And it can take two to four or six hours that they're not getting paid for, right? And that's two to four or six hours that they could be seeing other clients. So in the scope of the Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, we are teaching iridology in such a way that practitioners can stop working unpaid overtime. They can actually create their client programs right in their paid client sessions. They can stop overwhelming their clients because if it takes you two hours to put it together, it's going to be more than the client can handle, right? We teach you how to begin creating programs that will actually increase client compliance, client success, and long-term retention. So if you are a holistic health professional and you want to learn more than just iris markers, if you actually want to learn how the markers play off each other, if you want to be mentored in learning how to create programs for your clients based on iridology. If you want long-term support as you learn this and even after the course is done, then this course is probably for you. The goal of the course is to teach holistic practitioners constitutional iridology and how to use it confidently so that you can easily integrate what you already know about nutrition or herbology, for instance, to confidently create doable client programs in your paid client sessions. How does that sound? Does that sound like something that could benefit you, that could really work well for you? Peggy's on Facebook. She says, I did the course um, live with Judith. She's amazing. She's even made, even, she's made me even more interested in iridology and health. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah, she's one of my course grads as was Sherry Strassel, and we've got Theodore, or Theodora, sorry, Churchu here. Um, Z is in, saying it sounds good, excellent. So here's the things, some basic information that you need to know. The next course start date is November 11th. It will be running four till 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm not gonna give you any more details about, um, about all of it, uh, except to say that if you live in a time zone where 4 to 6 p.m. my time is like 3 a.m. your time. You can either get up at 3 a.m. for the class or you can do what some of my other students have done and they simply watch the recordings because we record every class and store it on a site where you have access to it so that you can go and watch the class. Then we offer support through a private Facebook group that is only for my students and alumni and also through extra webinars that are at different times in the day where there are discussion groups where we talk about your questions, where we talk about cases you're working on. And it's where you get extra tutoring and mentoring. Kylie's asking, how long is the course? The course is 40 hours long, which is a long course, and it's run in two hour long segments. We meet once a week for two hours for 20 classes. It contains all of the curriculum you need to prepare for certification with the International Iridology Practitioners Association. So if you are a holistic health practitioner, and if you are interested in learning iridology and learning more about this course, for those of you who are with me on the webinar, I've just posted the link in the chat. Um, I encourage you to book a call with me, a 30 minute call for us to talk and see if this course is the right fit for you. Is this the right time for you? Will this course meet your needs? So this is not a high pressure sales call. This is simply an opportunity for you to make sure that the course meets your needs. And if it does, then we can help you get registered. And if it's not the right time, if it's not the right place for you, that's okay. We love you anyways. So I thank you so much for being with me today. I look forward to chatting with some of you on phone calls. I look forward to staying in touch with many of you through our Facebook groups, through Instagram, through other live webinars. And I hope you have a blessed day. And I'll just give everybody just another minute any other questions you'd like to ask about what we talked about with what shows up in the IRIDES 
uh, today for surgeries and traumas or anything else about the course that you would like to know uh, before you consider booking a call if you're a holistic health professional. Z says it sounds good. Z, I look forward to having you in the course at some point in the near future. Hi, A1 Lucy, AJ1 Lucy, good to see you. We've got, had so many people join us on Instagram and live on the webinar today. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm not seeing any more questions come in, but I do look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Take care and have a great day. Bye for now. Thank you.